So this is the conclusion to this desk filing cabinet system I made. Um, as of right now, this piece has multiple coats of paint on it, and I'm probably going to put a clear coat on it as well. That's not going to be in the video for two reasons. Um, I don't think I'll have that done by the time I upload this, as well as the fact that um, usually you can't tell a huge difference between applying clear and seeing clear from this angle on the camera anyway, so it, it would just kind of be almost a wasted effort. But this is pretty much done. It has a matte paint on it now. And um, when I was putting the drawers back into place, I scuffed it up a little bit, so it will probably get some touch-ups, but essentially this is done. Um, the customer and I have not worked out the fine-tuned details of installation, so I'm, if I don't get uh, images of it myself, hopefully they will send some over to me so I could update the thumbnail and you don't get this sort of truncated view that you've been seeing throughout the whole process. Um, as a heads up, the second half of this video is going to deal a lot with um, the HVLP gun that I bought f to paint this. Um, I ended up buying one because it was a huge time saver and because since this is going to be matching existing cabinets and I've been doing that a little bit recently, it's really hard to get a cabinet grade finish with a roller and a paintbrush compared to the cabinets that people have in their kitchen and in their homes that are painted by a machine. Um, the finish is almost flawless. So in order to, to match her finish and get a bigger, better product out of my shop in general, I bought one of those guns and I was kind of nervous about buying a cheaper one, but it ended up working out pretty nicely. So um, the second part of this video is mostly, mostly going to be discussing uh, that gun. So to start off this video, I'm going to be working on the top. So I have a leftover piece from my plywood. I tried to keep a piece eight feet long so I didn't have to buy a third piece of plywood. And so I only had to make a couple joints in order to get this to be 10 feet. So I ripped that down to size. Now I ended up having to join two separate pieces on here. So to do that, I'm going to be using some splines. And this is essentially a, a slot cutting bit. So it's a quarter inch slot cutting bit and I could run it along the edges on the end of my ply as well as the edges on the pieces I'm adding. And then I could cut a spline and have a nice solid joint in all those pieces. So here's my two edges. I'm also using that bit in there. And it gives me a nice groove. And then I'm just using some, some poplar uh, stock I had around. I usually have thin pieces of plop, poplar because I make a lot of cabinet doors and you usually end up with some thin pieces and then you could see I could slide this into place and once this is painted this um, seam is almost invisible. So I usually use um, edge banding on the edges of plywood however since this is a desk and I believe it is going to be used uh, children are going to be using it I wanted um, hardwood on the edges because that veneer could could peel off and get uh, nicked and dented. So I used that slot cutting bit once again on that tabletop once it was glued up. In the back I'm not going to be putting anything just on the sides and in the front. And then I went through and I trimmed off some pieces of poplar to get it. The poplar was consistent with the length I needed and the width I needed in the front. So those are the thicknesses I cut. The sides ended up being a little thicker, so you'll see how I deal with that later. And then I pre-cut a bunch of my miters because I'm going to join these with miters. I'm also gonna, going to join the front seam with a miter because I do not have 10 foot pieces of poplar. In order to put the slot in the poplar, this might not look super safe, but um, it's how I ended up cutting those pieces. And even though it looks dangerous on camera, it's not really dangerous in real life. And that is how I got the slots on the front. As you can see, there's some chip out on my plywood, which I'll have to deal with. But I used quarter inch plywood for, for this shim stock and this. And you could see how those pieces are going to fit. So the edges I left long, you can't see. I just cut the miter, the 45 on the front and left them long and I'll trim them down afterwards. And then I could add glue. You could see how because the side pieces were thicker than the front pieces, they stick out a little bit further. There's really nothing I could do to avoid that. So I'm going to just trim off that little nub that sticks out. And once again, since this is going to be painted, you won't be able to tell. 
in order to hold it in place while the glue dried I put some brads in there because it's going to be painted it's easy to fill brad holes on stuff that will be painted and then I just worked my way around the piece gluing together uh, this front edge and then I think I show the miter in the center Instead of putting a butt joint, which could kind of peel away from each other, that miter in the center is just a much stronger joint. So this is just trimming off the back once it is dried. So then I ca it came time to make the really skinny drawers, and I decided to join those with dovetails as well. It was easy to just put uh, a 14 degree angle on my table saw and make bigger single jointed dovetails. So this was just cutting the angle and then removing the scrap and then I'm left with with one dovetail because these drawers were really thin they're not even two inches once I had that I could transfer it onto my sides and then I could remove the material on the sides so this that's how I decided to join these um, it was easier to do this by hand than to set up some sort of jig or something to cut these so I'm just transferring my marks and those are that's the material I have to remove in order to get rid of most of the bulk of the waste, I'm going to drill it out after I, after I saw it down on the sides. So I'm just cutting these flush. I usually cheat a little bit on the inside so I could clean up the, the saw mark with a chisel. I'm pretty good at this point at, at uh, sawing things fairly straight, but I always give myself a little bit of leeway. And then I'm removing the bulk of this with a Faulkner bit just to save some time. Plywood's kind of a pain to chisel anyway because the plies are laminated perpendicular to each other and then I could go through with a chisel and just clean up that joint so I had very little to remove because I used that drill bit then I could test fit it and you're, you're going to uh, trim off a little bit here and there first first try was a little bit too tight and then I could just go through and you could see remove a little bit and then that it ended up pretty perfect so I would do that on my other three corners. Once I had all those done, I could go through and put the bottom portion in. I tried to cheat this as close to the bottom as possible, just to give as much depth as possible in these drawers. So I have a quarter inch uh, dado stack in there because I wasn't gonna be able to put a median in this piece like I did on the bigger drawers because it's, they're so shallow. So I wanted to use a thicker bottom to, to help prevent bowing. Um, these drawers are not gonna hold a lot of weight, so I'm not super concerned about this bottom panel bowing over time. And then I could cut my, my notches in the back, just like I do for all of my drawers. I could dry fit it together, make sure it's square, and then I could cut my bottom and my back based on the measurements I take, and then glue everything together. So these went together pretty easily. Sink once my diagonals are, are the same, which means it's square. I can sink some brads in the back, and that is essentially the tiny drawer. Mount these the same way I do. Um, did the drawer slides on the on the big drawers? I mocked them up in place. Kind of you could see because these go deeper in, like I mentioned in the other video, that the slides are mounted much further back than than you're used to, even with inset drawers. They're a good inch and a quarter further back because they have to they have to clear that front and then after getting it just about right you could see they slide in there nicely you could see how it how I was talking about in the other video how they have to fit in between those those two pieces so then for the fronts of these um, I've gotten pretty good at pre-cutting these I really don't mess it up too much anymore so um, my openings were the same which is always nice I'm just using some pennies to, to shim out a sixteenth of an inch. I rough cut these. I used some pennies to shim them out. And then I could I could cut off another sliver and then screw these into place. Now since the front of these are half inch ply, I'm not going to be edge banding them because I've done that before and it's a pain with three quarter inch edge banding. I believe you can get it thinner, but um, I didn't bother looking for it because I'll just put some putty on the seams and once it's painted, you won't even be able to tell um, that it's plywood. As you can see, I'm just holding that face in place with the pennies in there and screwing that front in. 
and then I could do the same for the sides. The sides, once again, were square and the same size. So I just took measurements. I subtracted 3 16 of an inch, 16th of an inch on, a so on each side, and then these were going to get edge banded. So I subtracted 3 16 as that extra 16th to account for the edge banding, and it fit perfectly the first time around. Now, if you're using hardwood, you use, your reveals usually have to be a little bigger because the, the cabinet will be more subjected to seasonal humidity. But since my, the fronts of these are uh, plywood, I usually get away with a little bit of a skinnier reveal for the fronts. And then same process, I could kind of brace that front in place and then sink a bunch of screws through the, the backside into the front and that's how I'm going to hold it. Usually before I'm finished, I will pop these off, add some glue, and then re-screw them, but I don't, I don't, I didn't film it for this. And then once I move all my tools, I could test out the drawer and they work really nicely. These aren't soft closed doors. These are the ones that snap into place. I got those because the filing cabinets are so big, I didn't want to have to worry about them um, pulling themselves out. Then I went through and sanded everything. I don't get crazy because this is going to get multiple coats of paint, so I lightly sanded everything to 120. And then you could see to cover those plies, I'm just putting a little bit of putty on the edge. In order to paint this, the thought of hand painting it just almost made me want to cry. So I bought a spray gun. Um, this is not a sponsored post or anything. I have no clue how this is going to work. It was based off of reviews. It's an HL, HVLP spray gun. It's gravity fed. It's a little bit different than my other one. The reason I got this is because my other spray gun can only do oil-based paints. So this is going to be um, an acrylic and I just wanted to do it as fast as possible. So this is the gun and it comes with obviously the canister and a couple other parts. Um, you also need a filter because the compressor sends a little bit of oil and fuel through the lines, which can mess up your paint. So you're going to want a filter to filter out that stuff. Now the compressor I have had one on there, but it's an old one, and the person that gave it to me actually said, I believe that this either didn't work or leaked. So while I was at the store, I counted my losses. I think this was like $17. It wasn't terrible. And you also need one of these connectors because even though in the pictures it shows it has it, it does not. So you need one of these to fit on the end of your gun and connect your hose. I believe this was like $3 at Lowe's. So I'm going to spray most of this. Um, it will not be a thorough review because I think it's important with tools reviews. You ha really have to account for longevity of the tool with this. But um, for one job, I'll get a good idea of how well this works. This is the setup I'm left with with the new filter. I was able to remove a couple pieces of pipe because the old one, he had um, some fittings to, to step up the size of the brass fittings because these are larger holes, but these are smaller. So I was able to remove a piece. I actually could have gotten rid of this whole um, link, but you wouldn't be able to spin this on it would have hit the tank So I think that's why he had this kicked out so much now in the directions They tell you to put this filter as close to um, The spray gun as possible, but I'm keeping it on the tank because that's where the guy I got it from had his And because I know me and if I put this as close to the hose as possible, I'll probably break it quite quickly so um, once I re-put all this stuff together, I pressurized the tank and then tested for air leaks with some soapy water and it looks like I'm going to go. Now I don't remember the exact specifications on this specific gun, but I know that this tank can handle it because it's 20 gallons um, at 11 CFM. Whereas my little pancake compressor I think is only, I think it's less than 3 CFM, it's only 6 gallons and I don't believe that was enough from what I read online. However, in the comment section of this spray gun, someone said they did use their pancake compressor for it. So you might get lucky, it just might cycle over and over again. So I kind of dialed in the settings on the gun while I was painting the inside of the cabinets in case I messed up, it wasn't going to be a huge deal. Once I kind of played around with the, the adjustments and got it the way I wanted it to spray, this gun worked pretty well, but getting it dialed in took um, about five minutes or so. So you'll see I'm just kind of messing with the amount of paint coming out. 
which is nice because you can dial it into your preferences. I kind of prefer to move pretty quickly in most things I do, so I usually have more paint coming out than, than someone else might prefer until I got to the point where eventually it was coming out pretty nicely. I think this was on the, by the time I got to the back side, I had it coming out about the way I wanted. Um, this was the paint I used. It's a Benjamin Moore. I had to get this paint matched because it's a Martha Stewart color and they don't make, Martha Stewart doesn't make her paint line anymore. So there's a place online that I could get it um, matched to a Martha Stewart color because the customer actually called Home Depot and they said they couldn't do it. And stores around here are still kind of sporadically open because of Corona. So this is the top coat going on and you could see by the time I got to the top, top coat I had it down pretty well. It was going on really smoothly, um, no splatter or anything like that. The other paint machine I have is, is not super nice, but this one was really nice and it wasn't expensive. I'll put a link to the description in there, in the, in the, in the text box. For the top, I'm using these figure eights to attach the plywood. Um, these move for hardwood tops, but since this is plywood, it's not super important that they move because the plywood won't move around a ton on you, but they're quick, easy ways to attach tops, so that's what I'm using. The thing I was most nervous about on this build was the size of these drawers. You can see once they were painted and put back in place, there was very little slop in them, a little, very little side-to-side -side rack, racking movement, and I was happy with that. So after about three coats of primer and um, three top coats, I'm very satisfied with this gun. So far it has held up really well. I really have no criticisms of it whatsoever. The finish is probably the best finish I've gotten on a piece out of this shop. Um, these are really nice because since you're watering down the paint, it dries really quickly which is nice in an environment like this where there's so much dust in my air. I don't have a specific room for painting. Um, when, it, when stuff dries faster, there's a better chance you won't get a bunch of dust in your finish. So really, I'm going to try and keep up to date in my videos and mention when I use this gun to see how long the results of it last. But I definitely think it was worth, I think this was $25. The extra parts I end up buying for it still kept this probably under 40 bucks. Um, like I said in the beginning, someone said in the reviews they used a pancake compressor with this. I didn't even try that because I honestly don't think it's going to work. The specifications for this are higher than what your pancake compressor can um, put out, so maybe the person was confused with what sort of compressor they have. But the big compressor I showed you earlier in the video was cycling pretty regularly while I was painting this. Now, if you were painting something very small, like a little intricate box or something, I bet you that something like this would work. But on a, a much bigger piece of furniture like this, I think you need that bigger compressor. And it's probably not going to show up on camera, but like I said in the intro, one of the big reasons I bought this gun is because when you're putting something in someone's home that they got from a big box store or a, a, a place that specializes in cabinets, they're using fancy equipment to get those finishes on there, and there's no streaks or anything in the finish. Even a roller will leave somewhat of a texture in a finish. These spray guns leave a flawless finish. So I don't know how well it's going to show up on camera, but you can see this is the tabletop. There's absolutely no marks or anything in it, so it's just going to match the pieces in the customer's homes a lot better. So as an overall purchase, I'm really happy I got it. I'm going to be even more happy if it lasts for, for quite a while.